Hello and welcome to a new video with the electric trucker. This is my last week with the MAN ETGX and I'm taking it through the mountains to Italy to visit the Alpatronic headquarter. I found my trailer and in the last video I complained about these wheel arch covers being too high and scratching on the trailer, but in the end, it's up to the truck driver to check whether things fit or not. And if it's built with a relatively flat fifth wheel, then you simply have to remove the covers. You can't be too lazy about it because ultimately you're the only one responsible for damages. I'm now heading south toward the Stuttgart region. I entered the first destination into the navigation system and started driving. That's my usual strategy these days since I can pick charging parks along the way. First charging stop of the day, right off the A1. It's super crowded here because there's a massive construction site on the A1 and trucks are piling up everywhere. My trailer is parked all the way up front and I'm charging here at Ionity with 350 kilowatts. We're fully charged again. The 45 minute break was enough to recover the energy from 4 hours and 15 minutes of driving. That's perfect. I couldn't have used much more energy anyway. The truck is once again super efficient. Since this morning I've driven 500 kilometers at 0.8 kilowatt hours per kilometer. A top result. And I did some more research into what makes this truck so efficient. The digital side mirrors alone only reduce consumption by about 0.8%. The electric drivetrain itself is more efficient but that only accounts for around 1% savings. A major factor that I did not know about is the losses within the electric drivetrain, specifically in the inverter that converts the battery's DC power into AC for the motors, and in the motor itself. These losses are proportional to the square of the current, and since current is proportional to torque, it means the more torque, the exponentially higher the power losses. So minimizing the load on the electric motor always helps reduce energy loss. If the Iveco draws 800 kilowatts and the ETGX draws 330 kilowatts, that's a huge difference. At a steady 80 kilometers per hour, both trucks probably require similar torque, so their power losses would also be similar. But climbing a hill or accelerating from a stop is where the difference really shows. The same principle also applies with regenerative braking. You don't get all the energy back because there are similar losses in the electric motor and in the inverter. And that's why people always say that coasting is the most efficient way to drive. Once you've used energy to get the vehicle moving, the best thing is to just let it roll. Because that way, there are no drivetrain losses at all. Of course, that's not really possible with a truck, since you're usually driving right at the speed limit anyway. But in the end, you have to drive the ETGX efficiently, not just because you want to, but because you literally can't drive it fast. It just doesn't go up hills quickly, and that's very much part of the vehicle's philosophy. Everything is built around efficiency. But starting next week, I'm going to try driving the Evoco more efficiently to see how much I can bring its consumption down. It's just after 7 and I've wrapped up for the day. I found a spot for the night and I'm charging the truck now. Going forward, I'm going to use charging stations I haven't been to yet. Always going to the same ones isn't that exciting anymore, especially since we already know they work. There are plenty of chargers out here. But the problem is that apps don't show which ones are actually the truck chargers. That's why I'm going to start writing down the charger IDs for the electric trucker app. Because for e-truckers, it doesn't matter if a car charger is free, we want to know if the truck charger is available.
I'm now on my way to the third drop-off point, and this route takes me through the Black Forest. A gravel truck just passed me, and honestly all the transport companies that operate in hilly regions should be using electric trucks. The regenerative braking saves so much energy downhill. Third drop-off is done and I'm still on schedule. I'm starting to get hungry, but I'll wrap this up first and then it's time to call it a day. Mission accomplished. And now the big challenge begins because I need to be in Bolzano tomorrow morning at 9. To get there I have to cross the Brenner Pass, but there is some major construction work on the route. My plan was to avoid traffic jams and drive during the night, since Austria's night driving ban doesn't apply to electric trucks. But due to my mandatory rest break, I won't be able to get there before 5 or 6 in the morning. I could go through Switzerland, but they have a night driving ban for all trucks. So instead, I'll head along Lake Constance, stay overnight, and then drive through Austria in the morning. I've wrapped up for the day just west of Lake Constance, and it's not that busy even though it's already 6.30. I had some issues with the charging stations. The first two didn't work, but the third one did. It's only charging at 213 kilowatts, but that's fine for the evening. Now I'm taking the dog for a walk, go for a run, take a shower, and then I'm calling it a day. But I didn't pass any supermarkets and didn't bring any groceries. Starting the week with an empty fridge is really dumb. I'm hungry all the time and have to fall back on gas station food, which isn't exactly healthy. A14, Rheintal Autobahn, Richtung Innsbruck. Für 71 Kilometer. During the night, I got myself a toll box and now the first charging session is running perfectly. Even though this is an older charging station, the ETGX is pulling 350 kilowatts. And there's absolutely no one around, so I'm parked a bit cheekily. But I'll say it again, at night it's total anarchy at the charging parks. You can basically do whatever you want. During the day it's a different story, but at night no one is bothered by the trucks. This pre-production truck has a small teething issues where it won't start. That doesn't happen often, but the explanation was that I turned the key too quickly. But it should work again in a moment. Ha! <laughs> I have to take a little detour because a tunnel is closed, but driving through here is a pleasure anyway. We're down to one lane because of the construction on the bridge, but it's not that bad. The navigation system doesn't show any major delays either. I thought it would be worse than this. This week is the tour with the most beautiful views. I can't even put into words how stunning it is here. You're probably wondering what I'm picking up today. I love transporting things related to the energy transition, but what's still missing are charging stations. That's why I'm heading to the company Alpitronic to pick up new charging stations. Their headquarters are in Bolzano and I'll get to take a look behind the scenes. I arrived in Bolzano with 64% battery remaining. Since the last charging stop I drove 230 kilometers, used 177 kilowatt hours and recovered 50 kilowatt hours through recuperation. That results in an average consumption of 0.55 kilowatt hours per kilometer. As we say in Germany, da kannst du nicht meckern. You can't complain about that. Now I'm at the company Alpitronic and I'm here with the managing director of Alpitronic, Philipp Senona. I'm the managing director and one of the four founders. We're based here in Bolzano where we do research and development and we have nearly 300 people working here. And here you can see a whole bunch of charging stations. This is a 400 kilowatt charger of the latest generation and back there is a small 50 kilowatt charger. And here is my highlight. The dashboard showing all the charging points across Europe. This dashboard is absolutely wild. It basically just looks like a big green blob from all the charging stations that are installed and currently in operation. Now I get to drive my ETGX into the test lab and we can test the new 1000 kilowatt charger. This is our lab area where we can also test trucks and here we have the 1000 kilowatt charger. Inside the large housing is the power electronics and then there are two dispensers. The grey one with CCS and the black one with MCS and CCS. Until now, the power electronics and dispensers were built into each charging point, which made the connection to the grid very simple. Something like this is a bit more complex with the different supply cables, but the dispenser can stand up to 100 meters away from the housing. The grid power comes into the housing, then the alternating current is converted into direct current, which then goes to the individual dispensers. You can connect up to eight charging points, and usually dispensers have two charging points for efficiency and cost reasons. This grey one is a special model where we only have one CCS, but normally there's a second one on the other side. 
and here is an MCS plug, and the charging cable isn't significantly thicker or heavier than a CCS charging cable, but of course there's much more copper inside. Electric trucks are a new market for us where we develop different devices for different situations and use cases, like depot charging overnight, fast charging on the road, and charging at the loading dock. But all devices we bring to market are certified for 40 hours of continuous load at 40 degrees Celsius. That's very important for us because the first cars and trucks reach this maximum load range. Efficiency is also very important, and these have an efficiency of 97.5%. These dispensers have CCS and MCS cables. I'm the kind of person who thinks that CCS is enough because you have driving and rest time limits. I think we still have a lot to learn about the applications of MCS in real life, but you are a good example that it can work with just CCS, but I believe there will be a coexistence between CCS and MCS. There will be situations where you need to charge quickly with MCS, but for overnight charging, CCS is enough. And the small 50 kilowatt charger is also relevant for truck charging because it's perfect for slowly charging the truck overnight at the depot. That's the cheapest solution you can imagine because it's also the easiest to install. Philip, thank you so much for showing me around. And now we also hit the charging peak. There's currently no production truck that can handle more power than this, so I'd say it passed the test. Loading just started, and here in the warehouse, everyone's speaking Italian since we're in South Tyrol. These are 400 and 200 kilowatt chargers I'll be transporting, and I've never been loaded by three people at the same time before. My trailer is fully loaded. There are 22 hyperchargers inside weighing almost 15 tons. I've got three hours and 47 minutes of driving time left, and I'm heading back to Germany because I have to return the ETGX. Then I'll switch back to my Evoco and transport the hyperchargers to Sweden. I'll drive as long as I feel like, and then get some sleep. I'm at 90% battery now, so let's see how it handles climbing the Brenner fully loaded. I'm now at the highest point, and the truck drew a lot of power. I started at 90%, and after 87 kilometers, I'm down to 54%. That's an average consumption of 2 kilowatt hours per kilometer. Now let's see how it behaves downhill with regenerative braking. Strangely, my GoBox credit for the toll was already used up, and I just found out why. The employee entered the wrong emissions class, so I ended up paying the toll like a diesel truck. I should have checked that, but I'll get the money back since I have to send in the vehicle documents anyway. So if you're driving an electric truck in Austria and get a toll box, make sure to double check the drive type and emissions class. I'm now in Virgil, Austria, and finished for the day. The energy consumption going downhill dropped a lot, so over the whole trip, it's 1.05 kilowatt hours per kilometer. The regenerative braking was sufficient because there were lots of speed limits as low as 40 kilometers per hour. I've still got enough range left to get to Munich tomorrow and return the truck with an empty battery. <laughs> In logistics, every cent counts. I'll spare you a long talk about the infotainment system because it's painfully boring, it's just a classic navigation system from a diesel truck with no EV-specific interface or information. The menus are really convoluted and there's no live data or charging station info. I didn't expect much and like with many OEM systems, you expect nothing and still get disappointed. Same here. We're climbing the Urschenberg with 35 tons and we're just barely passing that truck here. So yeah, there are still slower trucks out there, but we're not exactly fast either. If we were fully loaded, we'd be about as fast as the one we just passed. I arrived in Munich with 20% battery left. This yard here is where trucks get delivered and loaded, and right now they're about to transport an electric bus. Today ends my three weeks with the ETGX. I drove almost 6,500 kilometers, and honestly, for a first-gen long-haul electric truck, the ETGX is pretty solid. As a fleet operator, you're not making a mistake buying one. From a driver's perspective, you can tell the truck is tuned for efficiency, but that makes sense, and after all, it safely got me from point A to B with low energy consumption. Next week, I'll take the charging stations to Sweden and come across an e-truck that has a total battery capacity of 1,338 kilowatt hours. If you want to see the video earlier, you can get early access with a YouTube membership. Wishing you a great rest of the day and greetings from Munich. Ciao.